Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. We'll be in Philippians chapter 2 this morning. As we uh, continue to make our way through um, this series, walking through uh, this book. And the um, uh, past couple of weeks, we kind of introduced uh, the church at Philippi. Um, that this is a letter from Paul uh, to this church. And um, it's not like other letters because it, he doesn't have some um, real grand scheme for writing or anything like that. It's a love letter that he's writing to this very faithful church, a church that he's close to. Um, and just expressing his love and his encouragement to this church. And what's painted is a very clear picture about what the Christian life should look like. And so that's what we're looking at as we make our way through this book is how should we live for Christ? What does that look like? And this week uh, we begin chapter 2. So I'm going to read verses two, or verses uh, 1 through 11 of chapter 2. It says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ... If any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each to the interest of others. If your relationships, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality of God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word this morning. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak, that you would open our ears, and that we would hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. As we make our way through this book, what we've been looking at is sticking with the theme of living. And um, today we're talking about the theme of living in unity. That um, Paul shows us here that as followers of Christ, we are to live in unity. In verse 2, he says, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. What he's calling for is for the church at Philippi and the church of Jesus Christ in general to live in unity with one another. And I think we understand that we're supposed to live in unity together. Like, I, I don't think that's like a mind-blowing concept. Like, whoa, as Christians, we're supposed to be united. Um, but when I hear him say, be like-minded, having the same love and one spirit and one mind, I'm like, huh, that's a lofty goal, isn't it? <laughs> Especially right now. It's a lofty goal. And I, I, it makes me pause and ask, how can we do this? How can we have the same mind? Because in my experience, as human beings, we're very uh, seldom like-minded in anything. Um, in fact, I think we live in a time where people more so go looking for differences rather than unity. And this isn't just a problem in the world, because I follow some of y'all on Facebook. <laughs> some of us go looking for an argument. <laughs> Um, and often Christians will argue amongst themselves. And unity seems like a harder and harder thing to find. So how can Paul tell us to have the same love and the same mind and the same spirit? Well, the answer to me um, is down in a football stadium. I love sports, so you know, that's, that's my go-to. Um, but on any given Saturday in the fall... You're going to find stadiums packed, filled with people from all sorts of backgrounds, beliefs, political opinions, a very diverse group, 
And for those three hours on Saturday, they are one. Why? Because they have found a common ground and a common passion. And that trumps any differences they may have. Now, uh, they may have a whole lot of diverse opinions, but for those three hours on Saturday, they are united behind a banner of the team that they're cheering for. The key to unity is to have something you love that trumps the differences that you have with someone. Amen. And in the church, this should be easy for us. That if we, to our, if we love God, then we ought to love him. And we turn our shared love for God, and we share that, and we focus in on that, then we should be able to let differences go, and love and unity should be able to flow through us. Amen. It's not that we won't have differences or don't have disagreements. It's that there's something more important at play. And because of that, we can lay down those other things and live in unity. And if the church would do this more often, I think it would be one great witness to the world around us. And historically, some have been able to do this. Uh, historically, George Whitfield and John Wesley um, definitely butted head on theological matters. They had differences of opinion. They have different, and these were public. But one day, someone asked George Whitfield, "Of all the differences you have with John Wesley, do you think you'll see Wesley in heaven?" And George Whitfield said. No, I don't think I'll see him in heaven because he will be so close to the throne of God and I'll be so far away. I don't think I will see him. (laughs) See, when there's a common love and a common passion and a focus on Jesus, we can be like-minded and united. In this passage, Paul tells us what we must do for this to happen. Um, For us to get to this place, how do we get to that place where we can let go of the less important and embrace unity? So let's look at what he laid out. And the first one is this. Unity means humility. You cannot have unity without humility. In verse 3 he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. One of the most important things we need if we're going to live in unity is humility. And I like this saying that humility is not thinking less of yourself but thinking of yourself less. It's not degrading yourself, but it's placing your focus off of yourself and onto something else. And I think we um, too often get the idea that humility is having a low view of ourselves. Um, But it's not thinking of yourself as worthless, but it's evaluating the needs of others and placing others as high on your priority list as you place yourself. And this is hard because of sin, because we are programmed to place ourselves first. We have this bent inside of us that always screams, me, mine, you know, what I want, mine, me, me, me. Um, it's all about me. And that voice can easily drown out the needs of others. Right. And we want the world to revolve around us. And if you don't believe me, um, if someone shows you a photograph and you're in it, where's the first place you look? <laughs> right? You're looking at yourself. How am I coming across in this picture? How do I look in this picture? And let's face it, you're not really interested in what's going on in the rest of the photo until you first look at how you're coming across. Right? Um, You look to yourself first. William Barclay said this. He said, there is a desire for personal prestige. And prestige for many people is an even greater temptation than wealth. To be admired and respected, to have a platform seat, to have one's opinions sought, to be known by name and appearance, even to be flattered, are for many of us the most desirable things. But listen to what he said next. But the aim of the Christian ought not to be self-display, but self-obliteration. He should do good deeds, not that men may glorify him, but that they may glorify his Father in heaven. The Christian, should, the Christian should desire to focus men's eyes not on himself, but God. Amen. That's challenging. Well, uh, Winston Churchill was once asked, doesn't it thrill you when people will pack an auditorium every time you're giving a speech? And he said, yes, it is quite flattering. Um, but when I think about that, I also remember 
that if I was being hung instead of making a speech, the crowd would be twice as big. (laughs) See, because of this desire to please self, to glorify self, to have our needs met, it's impossible for us to live in unity until we lay those aside. A group can never get along, let let alone accomplish anything, if everyone is just trying to get their way. But in Christ, we are called to humility. And humility requires first that we see ourselves in reality. That we are very small creatures in a vast universe who are sinful and incapable of saving themselves and are in need of a savior. And that is exactly why the message of the gospel is resisted by so many. Because we don't want to see ourselves as small. We don't want to see ourselves as unimportant. And don't tell me that I can't save myself. Right? We, we resist that in us. But until you come face to face with this reality and fling yourself onto the grace and mercy of God, you'll never experience of the, the beauty of the gospel Amen. and what living in Christ means. Right. It's about accepting our shortcomings and laying down our pride and coming to our Savior. And when we do that in humility, it should change our whole outlook. If I am in Christ... I know that I am nothing without him. Amen. And that his way is better. And so, because of that, I can lay aside my wants and my desires and my self-centeredness and preferences and instead see life and others from a new perspective. Amen. And if I look to others from the perspective of the gospel, that just as Jesus died for me, that he died for them, that we need each other, and we're working towards the same goal, we have the same mission and the same Lord, then humility can come. And I can look to the greater good and even find joy in valuing others above myself. Mm-hmm. Romans twelve sixteen says, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Mark nine thirty five says, Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and be a servant of all. In order to live in unity as God has called us to, it has to start of a humble heart. To see ourselves how we really are, to see God who he is, and live with that perspective and to place the needs of others above our own. Not demanding our way, but living for the good of the body and the good of the church. Secondly then, Humility leads to mutual care. In verse 4, he says, Do not look to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Paul says you are to humble yourself, to think of yourself less, and that as you do, it should lead us to looking at the needs of each other. Um, That meeting needs and helping one another should be the mark of a church that is walking in unity. In Galatians 6.10, Paul says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially those who are in the household of faith. Simply put, how can we claim we have unity and live in unity if we let our fellow believers in Christ suffer when we have the ability to meet their needs? See, if we ignore them and, and walk away, that's not very united, Right? That's saying, well, my needs are more important. I'm going to let them suffer so that I don't have to suffer. But if we humble ourselves and strive for our common goals and a common faith, we realize that we're there for one another, to help one another. Um, And when we do that, when there is mutual care in the church, it creates a deeper bond in the church. I've heard some people say things like, well, I don't feel very connected to the body. Uh, I don't feel connected to the church. And I have found that the people who often say those things are often the ones who have not gotten involved anywhere. That they don't participate in ministry. They don't try to get plugged in. Instead, they have this idea that the church is there to serve them. And you know what? The church is there to serve them. But what they miss is that they're called to serve the church as well. Amen. And it goes back to being self-centered. Um, if all they're looking for is their own interests and desires to be met, never asking what they can do for the betterment of the church, instead just asking how the church can better me, um, that's a very selfish way to look at things. And it's not unity. That will not create the spirit of unity in the church. But when 
people who are united ask, what can I do to help? And when we have that attitude, what happens is everyone serves, but everyone also gets served. Amen. Both happen. You get served, but you also serve. Right. And I love the body of Christ when it comes together in those ways. Um, because as I have served, I have to say, you all have been incredible to me and Michaela that as we have served, our needs have been met and, and, and then some. And I thank you for that. That's how the church should be. Amen. That we serve together and we meet the needs of each other. And a question we should all ask is, what can I do to help others and therefore promote unity in the church? Because we are all uniquely equipped to help in some way. We all have gifts to use in the body. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11 says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's varied grace, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that everything, in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I hope you hear the maturity in that. One of the marks of the Christian church should be our mutual care for one another. And that's one reason why I think Paul loved the church at Philippi. Because they were a church who looked out for others, and they looked out for Paul. In chapter 4, verse 15, and we'll get here in a few weeks, but Paul says, Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel... When I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. So Paul talks in that chapter about how the church at Philippi had supplied Paul. They have given to Paul's ministry. They had helped him. And Paul is encouraging them and us to continue to meet the needs of others. To keep caring for one another. And as this church had been doing and, and giving so generously as the occasion arises, he says, keep doing that. Keep serving. Keep this idea of mutual care. Because we cannot have true humility. Um, with, we can't have unity without humility. And humility means that we care for one another. And then thirdly, mutual care leads to Christ-likeness. In verse 5, he says, any relationships with one another, after he just said to do these things, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Paul says that when you relate to one another, do it in the same manner of Jesus. And I'm like, okay, so what does that look like? How do I relate to people in the same manner of Jesus and conduct myself as Jesus did? Well, he answers that in verse 6. He says, For who, being the very nature God, did not consider equality of God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The, the Greek word there for nature um, implies that uh, Jesus' very nature was that of divine. His very nature was that of God. Yet in all of that, he took on human form. He emptied himself. And he became obedient to the Father, even taking that obedience so far as to die on a cross. Amen. One of the incredible mysteries of the faith is that Jesus was fully man and fully God at the same time, yet chose as a man to die on our behalf. He poured himself out his very life on the cross. And Paul says, this is the mindset you are to have in your relationships with one another. Now that is a challenging thought, is it not? But that's why we need humility and mutual care. That when we practice those things, we'll become more empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we will resemble Christ more and more. Right. Second Corinthians 3.18 says... And we with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We should be coming more and more like Jesus. Amen. And this is not just an individual thing, but this is a corporate thing as well. 
that as the connected body, as the church, we, united together, should be becoming more like Jesus. Can you think of the type of unity that could exist in a local body where the individual members were striving for Christ-likeness? That's why in Ephesians 5, uh, Paul says, Submit to one another out of Christ. The, the key to unity is not always agreement. It's not always that we see eye to eye, but that we submit to one another. Amen. And this is the Jesus way of doing things. That just as Jesus submitted to his Father, we are to follow that example. Submitting to God first and then to one another second. Not demanding our preferences, not demanding our way, but walking in the type of submission that leads to greater unity. Amen. And you know, I struggle with this because, um, you know, I want my way sometimes. <laughs> um, I want to be in first place sometimes. But when I look at the gospel and I see what God wants to do in a body, I can gladly lay some of my wants and desires aside Amen. for the unity of the church. And you know, anytime someone demands something from the church, I struggle with that as well. And almost just as a knee-jerk reaction, want to say no. <laughs> um, because that's not the Christ way. Demanding your way is not the way of Christ. If we are humbling ourselves and caring for one another, we can grow to look more and more like Jesus. That's right. And as we do, we can submit and submit with joy. And that will lead to greater unity in the body of Christ. So who are you resembling? There is a, um, um, a wall near the entrance of the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas, with a portrait of the following inscription. It says, James Butler Boneham. No picture of him exists. This portrait is of, is of his nephew, Major James Boneham, deceased, who greatly resembled his uncle. It is placed here by the family that people may know the appearance of the man who died for freedom. Well, you know, no literal portrait of Jesus exists either. But his likeness should be seen in you and me and us. Amen. That when people look at us, they should be able to say, that's what Jesus would look like. Amen. So are you growing in Christ's likeness? I'd like to challenge you to examine yourselves. Are you able to put the needs of others ahead of your own? Are you looking out for others and caring for them? And are you willing to walk in submission to promote unity in the bodily, body of Christ? A good question to ask um, before we speak, before we complain, before we put post, push posts on social media is... Does this promote unity or discord? Does this show Christ's likeness or does this show self-centeredness? Does it build the body up or does it tear it down? Is it what Christ would want or is it a device the enemy could use to sow, to, to sow disunity? And remember at the end of the day, no matter how frustrated we get at one another, and we will, we're on the same team. We serve the same Lord. We have the same mission. We have the same goal. Amen. And there are some glorious possibilities when we walk the road of humility and care and submission and are united together. Right. When God's church stands united, the gates of hell are shaken. Amen. And that's why you look at from the beginning of the Bible till now, one of Satan's greatest strategies is to sow disunity in the body. And that's why, um, I mean, quite honestly, almost every day I pray, God, peace and unity in your church. Amen. May we handle differences well when they come, but may there be peace and unity in your body. Paul's message for the church at Philippi and God's message for us this morning is go out of your way to stay united Amen. and represent Christ well. And what a message for today. When you look at everything that's been happening, I mean, there's not unity out there anywhere, it seems. There's division. And no matter what side you come down on, um, 
as we look at these issues of injustice and racism and racial injustice and the marginalized, may we walk in humility, listening and understanding before we speak. May we care for those who are oppressed, who are forgotten, who are marginalized, and show God's love. And may we walk like Jesus, love, humility, grace, and a message of hope. If we, as the church of Jesus Christ, would stand up during a time like this and show that to the world, that would draw people towards Christ. Because I said this, I believe, last week, there's only one thing that can unite us, the world around us, that can unite racial groups and political groups and all that. Only one thing can unite us, and that is Christ. Amen. The cross of Christ, the broken blood, the broken body and the poured out blood. That's the only thing we can truly unite behind. That's the only thing that will last if we place our weight on it. So this, this morning I would just challenge us. Look at, are you promoting unity? And what are you showing to the world? Is it a good witness for Christ? Or is it something else? God help us. <laughs> Father, I thank you for your words this morning. I thank you for this message of unity. And God, I pray you would help us to put it into practice. God, help us to love each other well and serve each other well. Help us to walk in humility and help us to resemble you. God, once again, I pray that in this body, there would be peace and unity amongst us. That where there is disagreement, we would find love and grace and forgiveness for one another. And God, help us to not lose focus of why we're here and who we're serving and what our mission is. And as we leave here this morning, may that be on our minds. God, help us this week to be lights for you wherever we're at. And give us the boldness to stand up for what is right. Amen. Go before us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, may you go in Christ and you are dismissed. <laughs>